And the Buddha taught breath meditation to his son, Rahula. He first gave him an exercise in developing patience and equanimity. And it's important to see how the two practices are related, because they show that equanimity doesn't mean passivity or simply accepting things as they are and leaving it at that. Rather, it's meant to serve a purpose, to make you see more clearly. To learn how to accept what can't be changed, but also to look for what can be changed. Where you can make a difference. Even when you accept the fact that there's a lot of suffering in life, it doesn't mean that you stop there. You look for the area where there is no suffering, where our suffering can be put to an end. When the Buddha taught Rahula, he said, start off at making your mind like earth. When disgusting things are thrown on the earth, the earth doesn't shrink away. We can also add that when wonderful things are thrown on the earth, the other earth doesn't get excited. The Buddha also said, make your mind like water. When water has to wash away disgusting things, it doesn't get disgusted. Well, like fire. When fire burns disgusting things, it doesn't get disgusted. When wind blows away disgusting things, the wind isn't disgusted. It stays unchanged. And we said, make your mind like that. But then he went on to teach breath meditation. And breath meditation wasn't simply accepting the breath whatever way it is. It was very proactive. Learn to breathe, he said, sensitive to the whole body, calming the way you breathe. Become sensitive to where there's pleasure, when there's a sense of refreshment or rapture in the breathing. Notice how these feelings have an effect on the mind, and then allow them to be, grow calm. So, building on equanimity and patience, you become proactive. Which means that the equanimity and patience are designed to make you see clearly. You lack equanimity. equanimity Something happens and you react immediately and you don't see, well, what happens if I just sit with this for a while? Where does it go? When you're equanimous, you can begin to see cause and effect more clearly. And you can see where there's stress. for the purpose of saying, well, what causes it? What arises together with the stress? What causes the stress? The stronger your equanimity, the more you can see. So equanimity is not an end in and of itself. It's a means to knowledge, the knowledge that we develop around the Four Noble Truths, looking for the stress, trying to comprehend it to the point where we can see what's causing it. What activities are you engaged in that are contributing to the stress? Well, you learn how to stop them. You drop them. That's where you let go. So essentially, you're learning the terrain that life doesn't necessarily follow your wishes. But if you're patient enough and observant enough, you begin to see that it does offer opportunities for an end to suffering. That's essentially the Buddha's message. And you want to develop your powers of observation so you can see that for yourself. And 
This is why we practice concentration, to get the mind solid in the face of whatever comes up. But that solidity has to come from learning how to develop strengths, develop a sense of well-being, a sense of ease inside the body and ease inside the mind. So it's to assist in keeping you strong. The secret to patience or endurance is not to focus on the hard things you have to endure, but to focus on where you can still find sources of help. You can still find sources of strength. And learning how to be with the breath in a way that induces feelings of pleasure, feelings of rapture, refreshment. It's an important source of strength, both for the body and for the mind. This provides you with a gen general pattern that you can use throughout life. When you run into limitations, first you test them to make sure they really are limitations. And if you find that they are, then you look for other areas where you can be of help, where you can make a difference. There's an old woman in Thailand who went with a friend to see a John Mahabua. The friend was suffering from cancer, and the two of them stayed with the John Mahabua for several months. John Mahabua gave a Dharma talk every night for the woman who was suffering from cancer because she knew she was going to die. And the friend, the old woman here, had gone along because she was a doctor to look after the woman with cancer. after the woman with cancer died, they had a lot of tapes. They had taped every Dharma talk. And so the old woman set about transcribing the tapes. They ended up with two very large books. And she said in the preface to the books that one of the lessons she had learned from Ajahn Mahabha was, as you grow old and you find yourself running into limitations, you look to see the area, where the areas are where you still have strengths, where you still can make a difference, where you can still offer something of goodness to the world. But you're still strong enough to transcribe the tapes. So that was her offering. There's a similar lesson in the, the canon. A couple of old Brahmins go to see the Buddha. Say we're now old. How do we live as we're old? He says we can still be generous. Even though there are limitations on your strength, there must be some ways in which you can be generous to the world. Look for those. This principle applies all throughout the practice. You're sitting here, you find that there are areas in the body that are painful. You can ask yourself, well, which parts of the body are not painful? How can you breathe in ways that will induce a sense of ease in those other parts of the body? So that sense of ease becomes stronger, and you begin to use, to use that as a foundation, as a strength in dealing with the pain. So things don't just stop with equanimity. The purpose of equanimity is so you can see more clearly. Your mind is more still, less likely to be swayed by events, so they can watch things as they actually happen. And you see that there's still an opening. Even when you face death, you realize there's part of the mind that doesn't die. As for the things that do die, you have to develop equanimity for them. And more than just equanimity, you have to learn how not to identify with them. The Buddha talks about different levels of equanimity. There's the equanimity that simply comes from keeping your mind calm and balanced in the face of input of the senses. 
calls that equanimity based on diversity or multiplicity. And then there's the equanimity based on singularity, when you get the mind a sense of oneness in strong concentration. This is more solid, this is more secure, because you have something really good to base the equanimity on, and not just a reminder that you want to stay equanimous, or you should stay equanimous. You've got a real foundation that lies beyond the reach of a lot of the input of the senses. But even that isn't enough, because you start identifying with that. Still, if you have to identify with something, it's a good thing to identify with, but if you want to go beyond that, but it recommends learning how to see where you're creating a sense of me and mine around that, the narratives that you build. First you can practice with other things. Once the mind is still, you can look at other affairs in your life to see what kind of narratives you built around them, your identity as a, as a painter, as a cook, as a carpenter as a musician. And of course, aging and death can get in the way of those identities. And you can ask yourself, does my happiness have to depend on maintaining that identity? Because that's originally why you created the identity to begin with. You developed those skills in search of happiness. And they do provide some measure of happiness, but that happiness has its limitations. Learning how to identify with the equanimity helps you step back from that, because you realize you've got something better, something more solid. Then eventually you learn how to look at the equanimity itself. Because even it is fabricated. But hopefully the practice you've had in learning how to cut through your old narratives can help you here as well. So when death comes, the things you have been identifying with, if you've had practice in learning how not to identify with them, it's going to be a lot easier to let them go. Then you can learn to look at the situation. Where are the escape routes in this situation? That woman who was dying of cancer, the John Mahabhu told her that when the time comes, have a very clear sense of your awareness as something separate from the pain. Now you don't want to wait to the last moment to develop that sense. You want to develop it as much as you can while you're still strong. realizing that your awareness of the pain is one thing, the pain itself is something else. One way of helping this along is if you see a pain in the body. Remind yourself there are body sensations and there are pain sensations, and the two things are different. Body sensations are things like earth, water, wind, and fire. In other words, your sense of solidity, liquidity, warmth, energy in the body. That's one level of sensation. Then there's the actual pain sensation. If you learn how to separate them, you can really observe the pain. The problem is we tend to glom them together. If you glom the pain with a sense of solidity, the pain becomes solid, and then it's just like this big lump. But if you see that solidity is one thing and the pain is something else, the pain just seems to flit around. It's very erratic. Not nearly as monolithic and scary as it originally seemed. So even though the pain may be there, you realize, okay, it's not the same th sort of thing you thought it was. You can see that it's something separate. The two things are together in the same place, but they're different things. Then you can apply the same principle to your awareness of both of these things. It's there, but it's separate. And then when the time comes, you can ask yourself, which is going to stop first, the pain or the awareness? 
and there'll be an awareness in there that doesn't die. We may have to peel away different layers of mental activity around it, but there's something in there that doesn't die. You can be confident of that. And let go of everything else. So this is how the Buddha has this developed equanimity and patience, or this is why he has this development. Not because mere acceptance is all you can do. If that were the case, there wouldn't be Four Noble Truths. There'd be only one. There's pain, suffering, stress, and you have to learn how to accept it. There was someone once said, the Buddha claimed to teach only one thing, pain and the ending of pain. In other words, the idea that accepting that you have to accept that there is pain, that's going to end the suffering from it. That's not what the Buddha taught at all. There is a way out. There is an escape. Suffering does end. But you have to learn to accept where there is suffering, what's causing it, the things you can change, the things you can't. That's what equanimity is for, so you can find the escape. The more solid your mind is, the more clearly the escape will appear. So when you run into areas where you're no longer in control, you no longer have the strength you used to have, look for where you still do have strengths. Make the most of them. Because it's in that fighter spirit, that your unwillingness to admit total defeat. That's how freedom is found.